This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and by popular request, here it is, the top of the line. This is the Samsung Notebook 9 Pro. Not to be confused with the regular Notebook 9, available in 13 and 15 inch sizes. This is the 15.6 inch Pro model. Previously, because Samsung is a little confused in the marketing department, they called it the T-Book 9 Pro, but they finally dropped that and they just call it the Notebook 9 Pro. Pro means 15.6 inch display. That's not so pro, but it's a 4K display. We have an Intel Skylake quad-core CPU, real processing power, a lot like the Dell XPS 15. NVIDIA GTX 950 M dedicated graphics, fast SSD. Gorgeous design, as you'd expect from Samsung. I mean, th this is their iconic design with the tapered sides, the stainless steel bare metal look con contrasting with the matte black. I mean, it's real pretty stuff. We're going to look at it now. For those of you who like the Samsung Notebook 915 inch we reviewed, but you need more horsepower, you need something with a quad core CPU, something that shows fingerprints on the bottom. Look at that. Yes, it does. Uh, but seriously, a dedicated graphics here. This machine competes more with the 15 inch Retina MacBook Pro, the Dell XPS 15, the Asus ZenBook Pro UX501. You get the idea. This has some serious computing power here. So if you're doing video editing, if you want to play games, if you have big number crunch jobs. This would be the laptop for you. And it's priced very competitively, which is neat. Samsung used to be expensive. Not so much anymore. It's a lot cheaper than Apple's MacBook Pro 15 inch with retina display. In fact, the comparable Dell XPS 15 is quite a bit more. Now the Asus is closer in price, but the quality is better on the Samsung. The design is more exquisite. Certainly in the build is impeccable on this machine. There's a lot to like here. I confess, I just love the look of the stainless steel cut edges there, how they contrast with the matte black body. Uh, the regular Notebook 9 series now, granted they are a little bit more affordable too, but that all silver everywhere thing was just not as exciting without this kind of look here. But anyway, you can see that we have curves around the side here, all really nicely done, perfectly polished, no sharp edges, and ports are pretty decent here. Two USB 3.0 ports on this side. And that's the Kensington lock slot there. Don't be confused. That's not the USB-C port. That is on the other side. And as we rotate it around, you can see what it looks like here. Again, beautiful fit and finish and attention to detail. Nice little cutout there so you can open the lid. And we'll take a look at the ports on the other side. And on this side here, there is our USB-C 3.1 port. And this is a Gen 2 port. That means 10 gigabit per second, not 5 gigabit per second. For those of you who are geeky, you know that Usually when you have Gen 2, it's an Alpine Ridge controller by Intel, which should do Thunderbolt 3, but Samsung doesn't say this does Thunderbolt 3. And honestly, Thunderbolt 3 peripherals are so hard to come by right now, it's hard to test that. We're still waiting to get some Thunderbolt 3 peripherals in. There's your combo mic headphone jack. We have another USB 3.0 port, full-size HDMI there, and that's where you plug in the power. And if you need mini display port, of course, you can just use the USB-C to mini display port adapter. Likewise for Ethernet, you can use a USB-C to Ethernet adapter on this. Inside, the matte black continues and the fingerprints will accumulate there. Get used to having a damp cloth and then a dry cloth to clean those off every once in a while if you're one of the tidy types that can't stand that sort of thing. Trackpad is a Microsoft Precision Trackpad, just like other recent Samsung laptop models we reviewed. It's very good. I enjoy using it quite a bit. Doesn't make me want to go running to a MacBook Pro 15 inch, which is one of the things that this competes with. Key travel on this, given the fact it's a fairly thin design, 0.7 inches at its thickest point, is pretty good. And Samsung does, just has some special sauce when it comes to their keyboards. They just really feel good to type on. I type at very quick rates, relatively error free. I honestly enjoy the keyboard on this more than the XPS 15 in that respect. It's a backlit keyboard. Obviously, it's high contrast, so it's pretty easy to see. We have an F and lock button if you just want the multimedia keys to be the go-to keys on the top edge. The display is a beautiful 15.6 inch Samsung PLS display. PLS is similar to IPS. And it, it goes after the, uh, the, the Dell XPS 15 here by having some pretty good color gamut. Now, with the Dell, you have your choice of a 1080p non-touch or a 4K touchscreen. And in this case, you only get the 4K touchscreen for your $1399 to $1499, which is a pretty darn good deal. It represents the full sRGB color gamut and 85% of Adobe RGB. 
Samsung claims 350 nits of brightness. Our colorimeter said 335 nits of brightness. Now we were running it in photo editing mode. You have a bunch of different color profiles with Samsung laptops, uh, much like their smartphones. And we went with that one because if we use the default dynamic, it could be changing on us constantly and the colorimeter would probably just get inaccurate results. It is possible that it runs even brighter, however, if it's in the auto or dynamic mode. And I'll show you what those settings are. Right here, you got Samsung settings. You, auto booting means when you open the lid, it turns itself on. You can char control your USB charging. And there's your different color modes. Auto, dynamic, standard, reading, warms up everything. It's supposed to be easier in your eyes. There's also a separate display section right here, and it gives you a visual example, same picture that they use on Samsung phones, in fact. And then there's real-time HDR if you want things to be ultra crazy and vivid and high contrast, and that will increase contrast. And uh, contrast on Samsung's higher-end PLS displays, which is used here in the Pro and also in the T-Book 9 Spin, have lower contrast than their cheaper displays used in the base Notebook 9 series. Go figure. Uh, something about achieving high color gamut, I guess, versus black levels is a challenge. And so the black level is not real great on this. It's about 0.7 at max brightness. So contrast is around 501, which is fine. It's not super stellar. It's not going to beat out Surface Book, which is one of the highest contrast displays you can get on a laptop these days, short of going for the very few OLED panels that are available. And while we're looking at the software settings, we have your audio sound effects settings, input control, power management, keyboard backlight brightness, obviously. So you got battery life extender for those of you who like that. You won't charge it to max all the time. Try to make the battery last a little bit longer. Anyway, the long and short of it is this is a beautiful display with wide viewing angles with Calibration, it's pretty color accurate too. It's good enough that I'm comfortable using this for photo and video editing. And the white point is 7,000 degrees Kelvin, which is a little too high, a little towards the blue white, which is typical of laptops. It's not off the scale compared to some others that we have reviewed, but that is what it is. And it is calibratable. Gamma is 2.2 at low brightness and at high brightness, and it veers off in the midst, middle settings to 2.3. Calibration, again, does help with that. But overall, really gorgeous display, and Samsung's pretty good at having relatively low reflectance on a glossy display. There, there will, of course, be reflections, but not as much, say, as on my Surface Book. Now, despite the Ultrabook looks that we have here, this is a strong performer. Again, it goes up against the 15-inch the Retina MacBook Pro, the Dell XPS 15, the ASUS ZenBook Pro UX 501. Here's our PC Mark 8 Home Accelerated score of 3032. That's a perfectly respectable score and makes sense with the 45-watt quad-core CPU that we have inside here. And for 3D Mark, this is the Ice Storm Unlimited score. That's one of the easier tests in the latest version of 3D Mark for testing. So 111,742. Now, this falls pretty close to actually where the 960M graphics card is, but this is the 950M. Uses less power, generates less heat, allows for a slightly smaller and lighter power adapter. This won't have quite the punch of 960M graphics, but if you're using it for gaming, and we're going to demo with Battlefield 4, it's still up there. This is still in NVIDIA's top tier of cards, the GTX GeForce line of cards. For Geekbench 3, exactly where we would expect a Core i7-6700HQ to score. You can see the single and multi-core tests there. We always run the 64-bit version of the test. So that's like every other quad-core laptop on the market, pretty much in terms of scores, which is neat because, again, it's skinny and it's quiet most of the time, too. The fans never really become very annoying at any point. You, you'll hear them, say, if you're playing games or I'm playing Battlefield 4, you can hear them, but they're not the raucous craziness that, say, the MSI Ghost Pro or the GS40 are when you're playing games. And here's our 3D Mark Fire Strike test, 3268. The SSD is a SATA3 interface. I, I don't know if it also supports PCIe. I have not swapped in a PCIe drive just to see, but those are respectable enough scores. And honestly, I <laughs> people get crazy for PCIe right now, and I 
some of the the early models that had that had a lot of trouble with drivers. It's it's ironing out now, and the speeds are improving. But for most people, unless you transfer lots of files or very large files daily, you're not going to notice the difference between a SATA three and a PCIe. SATA three also runs cooler, and given the thermal design of this and the, the attempt to design a very thin machine, I suspect Samsung wanted SATA three for that reason. And there's our CloudGate 3D Mark test score, 13,763. Uh, that's a little bit lower, certainly, than the GTX 960M. On average, we see the GTX 950M in the Samsung being anywhere from 10 to 15 percent slower. I haven't seen it drop as much as 20 percent on any synthetic benchmarks or in the frames we've been getting in games so far. And that GTX 960M has 2 gigs of DDR5 VRAM. Now, taking a look at the internals, and it's pretty easy to remove the bottom panel. I love Samsung's laptops. There's no fiddly plastic clips or anything like that, no specialty screws, just Phillips head number one screws, unscrew them, bottom pops right off. You can see the two fan design, one for the CPU, one for the GPU, very effective. There's obviously the battery there taking up a whole lot of the space. Now, the Wi-Fi is off on the left right there, but it's on a daughter card rather than being just a little entity unto itself. If you want to replace the Wi-Fi, though, I can't think of why you'd want to. You'd have to get that daughter card to replace it from SamsungParts.com or some such place. The M2 SSD is there. It's underneath that orange ribbon cable, which is easy enough to lift off. There's a connect on each end. Just lift up the left side, for example, and you have access to the M2 SSD if you want to upgrade to a higher capacity SATA 3 SSD. No idea if this supports PCIe. Haven't tried it. RAM is soldered on. You get 8 gigs of RAM. So if you absolutely must have more than 8 gigs of RAM, this is not the machine for you. Like the MacBook Pro, RAM is soldered on here. But the Dell XPS 15, for example, has actual RAM slots should you want to upgrade it. And of course, you could order it with 16 gigs. Samsung offers just one configuration, 8 gigs of RAM, 256 gig SSD, and that 4K touchscreen display. So a little bit less versatility there. And now here's a little Battlefield 4 love. You can hear those quad speakers. These are dual stereo speakers that are quite loud. Two watts times four. Sounds good. And the frame rates go anywhere from 70 down to the 30s here in very heavy firefight. We're playing on mostly medium settings. Some of them are a little bit higher. We're actually running it higher than GeForce Experience would recommend. So that's pretty good performance there for a laptop that's really game geared more towards pro apps, but can do some pretty serious gaming as well. And notice you don't hear any fans roaring, and it doesn't get hotter than around 80 degrees here, about 93 here. Anything below human body temperature, temperature is considered cool. The underside, dead center, usually your legs would be on either side. That's the one hot spot where it'll reach about 106 degrees Fahrenheit when gaming. And for those of you who are interested in some more graphics benchmarks, Unigine Heaven on high settings at 1920 by 1080 resolution, not native 4K resolution. That would be a little bit psycho. By the way, we're running the game at 1920 by 1080 here as well. Unigine Heaven scored 33 frames per second for an overall score of 820. Seven. The max GPU temperature was only 70 degrees centigrade, which is pretty darn chilly. Cinebench R15, 75.6 frames per second, which is a good score, and it means it is good for video production and media production. And here you have the competition to the Samsung in, in the, the higher line, kind of chic design, 15-inch quad-core laptop market. Dell XPS 15, first on the left. Smallest footprint by a little bit. It's also a little bit thicker than the Samsung. So is the Asus ZenBook Pro UX501 we'll get to in a minute. They all weigh around the same weight, which is in the four to four and a half pound arena. They all have dedicated graphics. Now the Asus and the Dell have GTX 960M versus 950M in the Samsung. So a little extra oomph. They all have SSDs. They all are available with at least eight gigs of RAM. In fact, the Dell you can order with 16 if you want. The Asus has a 4K display. The Dell has a 1080p or a 4K display. It's up to you and how much you want to spend. In terms of pricing, surprisingly, Samsung, who used to be one of the more expensive brands on the market, is now kind of the value leader here. To get the Dell XPS 15 similarly configured, other than the fact that the Dell 
would have 16 gigs of RAM at the matching configuration in all other respects. The Dell would be $19.99, it was $2,000. The Samsung is $14.99 and it's often on sale for $13.99 at Best Buy, which is pretty much the shop in America that carries the product right now. The ASUS ZenBook Pro UX 5.1, of course, is always a value leader too, and its price is $1,499 or $1,500, and it's a solid machine too. It's a little bit bigger, the display quality is not quite as good, the keyboard's not quite as good on it, so there you have it, a couple of key comparison points. Now, if you'd like to see a SmackDown, I, I think some of you might be interested in the Samsung Notebook 9 Pro versus the Dell XPS 15 particularly, shout out in the comments and we can make that happen. Laptop has the usual 720p webcam, which is not so different from most other laptops with the 720p webcam on the market, which is to say adequate, not ooh la la, wonderful, it's decent. It has Intel 8260AC Wi-Fi 11 ac with Bluetooth and this 2 by 2 antenna design, and it's some of the strongest Wi-Fi I have seen. Usually only killer networking is as strong as this, and it, it has really good range and really good throughput. Samsung did a good job here, which is particularly interesting because the regular Notebook 9 models, the super light and thin ones, don't have that kind of Wi-Fi stamina. Also, the laptop, uh, in addition to the standard very bright 300 and nifty, 50 nits claimed by Samsung brightness. It has an outdoor mode, so you can actually raise that to 500 nits. Now, you don't, don't do that all the time. You'll tank your battery life, but it, it's a handy option to have if you need to use it in a truly insanely bright environment. Speaking of battery life, well, how is it, right? Everything can't be good about this laptop. And as is the case with other thin and light quad-core machines with dedicated graphics, don't expect this to be an all-day, all-night Energizer Bunny. It's not. It has a 57-watt-hour battery inside for cell. That's not a very high-capacity battery. That's similar to the lower-capacity battery option in the XPS 15. And uh, Samsung claims 6.5 hours on a charge actual use time. And for once, you know, PC manufacturers tend to make wild claims that are hard to reproduce. We did, in fact, average six hours doing productivity and streaming video with brightness set to a more than adequate 50% and Wi-Fi on and active. So that's it's decent for a machine in this class. It's not going to compete with the 15-inch Retina MacBook Pro, but then again, it's also pushing a higher resolution display and arguably higher performing dedicated graphics, too. Now, the charger here is bigger than your usual Samsung Ultrabook charger because it has to be quad-core 45-watt CPU. Dedicated graphics needs more charging power. So this is a 90-watt traditionally designed laptop charger. Now, one of the benefits of the GTX 950M versus the 960 is it has lower power requirements. So you actually don't need 120 or 130-watt AC adapter. So this is a little bit more compact, a little bit lighter than some of the competition's power supplies. So honestly, when Samsung first announced the Notebook 9 Pro, back then still calling it the T-Book 9 Pro, uh, the Dell XPS 15 got announced at the same time, and I thought, oh, well, the Dell's just trouncing it, isn't it? Because you can get these highfalutin specs and all this kind of thing. And But now that Samsung has dropped the price a bit, and I've had long-term use of the XPS 15, I have to say there's a lot of things I actually enjoy about the Samsung. It's a worthy contender. If you want to do upgrades... Uh, of the internals and all that sort of thing. It's not as upgradable as the Dell. It doesn't have RAM slots, for example, and the wireless card is on a daughter board. But beyond that, this is a slim light pro apps machine that competes well against the Retina MacBook Pro, and it even holds its own against the Dell because for the price, you're getting an awful lot here. And the software on this, there's no bloatware to speak of other than Samsung's software that can link up to their smartphones. It's just a lot to like here for the price. So that's the Samsung Notebook 9 Pro. It's available now and prices have dropped on it. So honestly, it's a reasonable alternative to the higher end Dell XPS 15 and it gets you a lot of the same good stuff. You got your SSD storage in here. It is upgradable if you want to do it yourself. Samsung does not sell various capacities. 4K display, really nice 4K touchscreen in here. Good performance, very quiet, uh, stylish up the wazoo for sure. Great audio quality and also very stable, which is something <laughs> something that's a little bit, you know, you can't count on it with Windows 10 and Skylake inside. The earliest products had the most problems. A lot of them have ironed them out, but there's still a few that are flaky. But with Samsung, I haven't seen any driver crashes, any weird behaviors. It just kind of works pretty well. So... 
there it is. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos.